My name is Karen van der Borgt. It's a Flemish Belgian name and I'm living in Toronto. I'm working for, with the NFB and Radio Canada. Does anybody recognize this image? Yeah, La GT, Chris Marquet, one of my favorite films. Um, so I'm showing some, um, I actually come from a background in media art and it had a lot of different names, trans media, <laughs> cross media, new media. It had many names. Uh, virtual reality is a part of it. I helped artists um, make interactive, interactive installations with uh, sensors. I, at some point, I did get into pure data, Max MSP at some point. Then I started working for broadcasters and I had to forget about all that because I didn't have any time anymore. And I was in a strict post-production pipeline where we use this, um, this kind of software and that's what you're going to use. And, nothing else, and there's no room for experimentation whatsoever. So VR is fun because it gives you this, this is a little small moment in time where you can feel like you're a pioneer, like the pioneers in the beginning of the cinema. Whereas there were a lot of little different independent people trying to understand the medium. That's what we're actually doing at this point as well. So don't take my word for anything that I'm saying. <laughs> so I'm not, you know, I'm not a prophet or I'm not a, I'm not Jesus or Saint Mary or whatever. So certainly not our Buddha or Allah. Or so um, is VR so magically different from other, from other um, uh, mediums? Is it really that spectacular? If we go back in time, there's been many different kinds of inventions for uh, visual, in visual technology. So let's go back to the magic lantern. Um, that was like a real big revolution, right? The people called it the fright lantern because really people got afraid. They thought they were like real phantoms and, you know, people were really like impressed by it. So kind of the same what's happening now in VR where you have these uh, little uh, videos now mm -hmm. where people like take off their headset and they throw it away because they're so scared or they like bump into stuff or, or they fall, fall over. So besides having basic design problems probably in, in those uh, experiences, it's kind of the same, you know, history repeating kind of. And then um, after the magic lantern, we make a big leap and we go into Magic Leap. <laughs> Everybody knows about this company, right? This company that promises these great, you know, uh, uh, mixed reality experiences. They get a lot of money. Nobody saw anything except Beyonce who thought it was crap. <laughs> so I don't know what it's going to be, but we'll see, right? Yeah. <laughs> In Inshallah, right? We, we, will, we don't know yet. So. Um, but of course, I looked at it, I mean, uh, as you know, but I'm not really going to talk about Ocean School, but it's one of the projects I'm working on. It's education. I think education is really the basis of having a civil society. Um, and um, so I think it's very important to, uh, you know, of course, it could be really fantastic to use in, in classrooms. But at the moment, the technology is not available. And we can't really say that they're actually sharing anything. And they're not really open source at all. So I come from an open source background. So I'm not really, um, I'm a bit wary of this kind of companies. Um, I think technology should you know, benefit the greater, the bigger public good, and not just uh, a couple of guys, mostly white. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Have you ever checked in? Have you ever wired trip? You ready? No, no. <laughs> this is not like TV only that is. This is life. It's a piece of somebody's life. It's about the stuff that you can't have, right? The forbidden fruit, straight from the cerebral cortex. I mean, you're there, you're doing it, you're feeling it. You begin to see the possibilities here? <laughs> I'm your main connection to the switchboard of the soul. I'm the magic man. I'm the magic man. 
magic man. <laughs> Does that, did anybody see this film? Yeah, Strange Days. Uh, I love science fiction. A lot of things in science fiction, you know, sometimes are already here, or you should also get, check out, of course, the uh, series uh, Black Mirror. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of things that are said there are things that we actually hear people saying about virtual reality, so I thought it was quite very funny that a mini disc could actually, could actually also do that. Now, of course, there was also this thing that kind of looks like the Muse uh, uh, headset. It's like, a, I don't know if you've ever tried it, uh, to, um, uh, it's actually capturing your brain waves. Um, so yeah, we could start with the basis and say, you know, what is reality after quantum mechanics and reality TV? So uh, I sincerely hope that reality TV doesn't start to make virtual reality TV. I think reality TV is like the source of all evil and you have the living proof of it here in the US. So um, uh, anyway, but let's, you know, there's a lot of, I am not a, like, a, I read a lot about psychology and philosophy because I'm, I'm trying to be a responsible uh, visual artist. <coughs> you don't need to, you can just go with your guts and so on. But am I also not saying that I have read all the philosophical works of Walter Benjamin and Reality and Paul Virilio and whatever Jean Baudrillard. I mean, I read some of the books. There's so many things to read and to understand, right? But um, I think we can, um, uh, talk about perceptual reality, so <coughs> what you are uh, perceiving as reality might not be the same as I, and then we come into fake news, but I'm not going in there. But, you know, they're not, uh, we all come from different backgrounds, so we'll perceive the world differently, so that's why it's important to have diverse crews and diverse people working in in image making because it's very powerful. I mean, a lot of humans uh, uh, history goes through uh, creating images get coming from uh, the, the, the drawings in caves and, and so on. So it's a very powerful tool that, pe that we have been using as a species for a long time. So I think uh, you should, you know, think about the, the, the impact. That's what we call ethics. I mean, I come, I did this an art school and we had a, a six, eight hour course on ethics and aesthetics in cinema. And my course started, my teacher would come in and bring this package of copies and it was la neurobiologie de l'image, the neurobiology of the image. And that's what we started to read, first hour. I mean, we spent a lot of hours reading that and not in class, but outside of class. It was supposed to just something that we needed to do. Reality TV, um, the United Nations actually, it might be now another link, I didn't, sorry, I didn't check up the link, because they, uh, the United Nations has been investing in virtual reality because they think <coughs> it actually will change how people perceive uh, other people's reality or, and, and, and make comparisons with there, and they think people are gonna be engaged more, are gonna be, uh, more compassionate. So that's wh what they believe. And let's see what reality TV does for that. So it's a series, I don't know if you know, it's called Go this Back Where You Came From. Never allow people who come here illegally by boat to gain permanent residency in Australia. We are claiming back for Australia. Now we decide who is a refugee and who is not. Australia has tough new policies on asylum seekers and refugees. Two boats forced back by the Australian Navy towards Indonesia. The boats may have stopped, but the debate continues. Now six ordinary Australians with strong views have volunteered to undertake an extraordinary experiment. <laughs> And to walk in the footsteps of refugees and asylum seekers. Please uh, help us. Can you help us? They'll experience Australia's hardline policies firsthand. I can't believe we do this. This is this is bullshit. For volunteering for the 25-day journey, a former Vietnamese boat person, I was a refugee. When I came here 
the right way, they can be jumpers. I've stopped the loads Facebook campaign on And Australia is under attack. We already have the terrorists here. We are already living amongst the enemy. A detention centre whistleblower. If we don't shut the detention centres, I think there'll be more deaths in, in custody. Two sisters with opposing views. We'll just be overrun with people from other countries. They're not here to take jobs. They're here to make our society better. And a tough talking teacher. But if you let people settle here, more votes will come. It will happen. It has happened. You won't anything. I hope you hear the banks. That is the war. Follow six Australians on the most dangerous and confronting journey they have ever undertaken. They will die. They're still people. Because the white faces will hold their title. I'm just so upset. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'd like to find out where King's compassion ends for these people and why. That's because I've just about had enough here. So go back to where you came from is uh, it was a concept that was bought by several European television um, uh, broadcasters. So in Belgium, they also uh, did one where they actually also send off politicians to uh, Syria and then try to get into Belgium. They actually agreed in doing it, right? So the funny thing is that for example, the politician, who, by the way, was from Turkish descent, but is against immigrants, uh, you know, she um, didn't change her views, right? Because she can't, right? So it's interesting to see, because this is literally almost putting somebody, you know, in somebody else's shoes, and some of the VR promise exactly that, right? And then... You know, when you see what happened and, and the articles that were uh, published after the series and everything, you know, some people did change, or, you know, um, but not all of them, right? Because we are so good in blanking out things that we don't want to understand because it's just, um, you know, we can't deal with reality, right? So... I'm not giving any answers to this. I'm just throwing it out there so you can start, you know, hopefully it will um, give you some ideas um, to try to sell it to an American broadcaster. I don't know, but um, so very interesting. Certainly, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going too fast. So escape to reality with Blore Hot Dog Cinema is a slogan of the Blore Hot Dog Cinema. UN and Jesus Christ, because actually when I, I saw the hot dogs slogan and I typed it in Google, I had a lot of religious websites having this as a slogan as well, escape to reality. <coughs> so because, you know, uh, of course, hot dogs tr tries to sell the entertainment value of documentary. Of course, a lot of documentary <laughs> filmmakers feel that they are uh, almost activist, because we should make distinctions, I think, between more reflective documentary work, activist work, which is a whole other thing, right? We shouldn't mix them. I mean, you can mix them, but they're different, right? Uh, journalistic pieces are different from activist or reflective documentary. Uh, cinema verité and direct cinema are not the same as, um, as a scientific documentary. Right? So, um, I mean, there's the, all different kinds of approaches that are all going to mold what they are talking about in their form because content and form are intertwined. So when you're changing your form, when you're using a new technology, the content that you're transposing in it or, or trying to um, uh, push is also going to change through it, through it, right? So it's, uh, you know, McLuhan who says the medium is the message and the message is the medium. That still is kind of true. I mean, the, 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 let's say that the earth will still be round 
in direct cinema and in a scientific documentary, maybe not in, uh, in um, a documentary by some sect who says that the earth is flat, uh, which of course it's like I could be an activist, <laughs> uh, uh, an activist documentary, but so um, I know some people don't like her, but she's a pioneer still in immersive uh, journalism. I might have other people who already talked about Noni de la Peña. So she was one of the, I'll just watch a little, I think the future of storytelling is also when an interesting pieces and I got so series. Much grief and so much pushback for what I was doing that, you know, I was an advocate, I wasn't a journalist, that, that, that these virtual reality things were games. And um, I used to take that criticism extremely seriously, but it didn't stop me. My name is Nani de la Pena, and I'm a pioneer in how we can use virtual reality to tell non-fiction narratives. <coughs> virtual reality has had its sort of fits and spurts and starts. The first big boom of VR was in the 90s, and when it didn't really materialize in a way that could be commercialized and, and really go out to the public, uh, people really disparaged the kind of uh, investment that went into it. But that doesn't mean people didn't stay working away at it. Now with Facebook buying Oculus Rift for $2 billion, I would say that the validation for virtual reality as a technology has come full circle. So in 2012, my piece, Hunger in Los Angeles, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. How many of us know about how hungry people have gone in America and how overstrained the food banks are? And we've read that over and over again. But then you put them on scene at a food bank line when they see this man collapse and chaos breaks out. I use real audio from the real events. You really can hear how that event unfolded and what the experience was like for people who were there. In order to do the body capture and make sure that we um, could reproduce our witness exactly as she really was, we use a light stage. And the light stage means that we can capture somebody in a 360 degree way and make sure we get every natural nuance of their physical presence. So the virtual reality goggles actually have like a tracking system with these bright cherry red lights that the cameras can use and they know exactly where you're looking in space. And that is what's key to making you feel comfortable. Despite the fact that the graphics seem limited or that we don't actually yet have completely photoreal um, characters and environments, it's amazing how experiencing through your body allows you to suspend any questions and you actually feel like it's real. Klaus Schwab, who's the head of the World Economic Forum, came through my lab at USC and did hunger. He took off the goggles and turned to me and said, can you build me something on Syria? It is another very powerful story. Again, using material that was captured on scene. It's a two-part piece that puts you in a corner in Aleppo when a mortar shell hits, a young girl is singing, and um, you really can hear the pain and the chaos of the ensuing event. Yes, I so um one must also say when we see the image of uh, um, uh, captured by a mobile phone that of course there's a lot of people out there, witnesses, filming lots of things. <coughs> and if you look on the web, you see, find a lot of uh, videos posted by, um, by people living in conflict zones or, or anywhere in the world, in a way, as long as they have a Wi-Fi or internet connection and they, it's, there's enough bandwidth to upload it. Um, so some of it winds up in our news um, casts, right? Or, or um, in uh, news articles. But I think she, besides, you know, there's, it's interesting, it's literally embodying. So it's, it's what we call room scale. So you walk around in the scene. That's what the Vive does. What she's using is kind of her, her own Vive that they, they build. But uh, so you walk around it, and that's of course very important because it's not only your eyes and your brain, but it's also your body starting to move, and that's going to be an extra um, layer 
in the experience. So when you create something for the Vive, you will do it differently than when you're creating for a cardboard, right? The, the, the mm -hmm. implications mm -hmm. will, be, will be very different. So I'm not sure if she is still here. Yes. 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 So she is, uh, you know, she uh, studies on, on role-playing games, and I think if we're talking about, you know, putting, in, you know, m m raising awareness and, and trying to make people understand some of these others, universe, in role-playing games, people are like projecting whatever they want to be on, on uh, these characters. And uh, there she uh, published some interesting articles that you might want to check out. Um, so, because as I say, we're very good in trying to blank out things that we don't want to understand. It's too much for us, right? We can't deal with it. So, you know, we, we, uh, we shut it off or we uh, project something completely different on it than what it is, right? So uh, Sherry Turkle, simulation is discontent. Um, so she's a professor of social psychology here at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, but uh, she's kind of talking about like the negative side maybe about gaming, because yes, we are talking about virtual reality maybe converging with games and documentaries with games. And there's been a, 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 um, already a, a history of, of games that can do good, like uh, what we call social games. They're mostly coming from indie developers. It's not Ubisoft that's going to uh, develop a game like that, right? So it's smaller companies. Uh, these are games that are intended to raise awareness or even uh, games that uh, while you're playing, you're actually donating to charities. So some of those games were actually quite successful in, in doing that. Um, and um, it's also called Games for Change. For example, I'm trying to develop um, a, v a mix between VR and, and gaming mechanics um, uh, on kids that are living in the streets a little bit in different countries, so not only in, the, in uh, North America, but in, in other countries as well. And then there are, um, I'm trying, the first stage is trying to make something in Montreal. So, you know, I looked at the, the different platforms and the different, um, so gamesforchange.org, there's a lot of uh, uh, good stuff there. Uh, interesting case studies, always interesting to read case studies. This is, for example, one about um, indigenous culture. So this is one of you can also now I have a blank for the title, but it um, <clears throat> it's also now available on uh, the iPhone. I think I put it on my wish list, so I'll check in later. It's on DocuBase, too. Hmm? It's on DocuBase. All right, okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so this is also a very interesting way what he's, what he's saying about stories, right? Um, uh, which is <coughs> very true, too, like fairy tales. I love fairy tales and, and myths because they, they contain... Uh, basic, the, the human condition, uh, in a way, like the basic forces in, in human lives are contained in fairy tales and in myths. So one of the first VR projects that I did was, was a particularly an embodiment, so that's why I've been like going through this. Um, I showed, um, I showed uh, the piece yesterday short, uh, briefly in class, 
So it's a multi-path interactive 360 video, first person, so you're in the body of, um, of um, this guy and um, you are thrown out in the street because your godmother doesn't want you in the house. So she um, decides you to throw you out of the house, she doesn't want you there. Um, and you have to make a couple of choices. The choices itself are not very interesting. Uh, I must admit, um, I didn't really write them neither, but it's what we call a proof of concept of a proof of technology was to check if we can <coughs> actually pull it off, right? Which we kind of did. So we use different, uh, it's available on the web and it's available on, in the Samsung Gear VR. Well, not really available. I can't really just give, give you a link to. On the web, you can watch it. Let me try to show you uh, like the beginning of it because it does do one thing that I think is going to be... Let me go out here and uh, go into Chrome. Um, okay, so... Uh, it only works in Chrome, by the way, so... Um, what it does do, it, I think, Inchasa. is important. Is there a mute? Yeah. So what it does do is Im what I think is important uh, also in certainly when you're making very uh, emotional pieces or anything is to gently bring people into the experience and take them out, right? If I'm going to uh, blow you up in the experience, then you, you might want to create something to, you know, get people in there and then get them out as well. It's because it's kind of like taking somebody, just throwing them off the bridge, right, if you're not doing that. I mean, it might be your idea of shocking people or raising awareness, but I think mostly that it's good to give some context and background to what people are going to see. Certainly in this case where you're like thrown into somebody's story. So um, I think we're going to, yeah, let me put some stuff. So your parents are separated and they're, you don't want to keep you in the house. I'll see if it wants to load. Okay, so... Um. So this, yeah, so, um, and then there's choices. So um, this is a reenactment, so it's not, of course, I didn't, it's a bit of, difficult to make a point of view uh, <laughs> <laughs> while things are happening, right? So of course it's a reenactment. And the, the director who was uh, working on the, he, he doesn't never ever played games in his life. And uh, so he was like, he was like putting these icons there, progression of energy and so on. And when I saw him doing that, it was like, mm, I'm not sure for this kind of work if you need this kind of stuff, right? It's an, I'm not, I haven't figured it out yet. I'll, I'll probably start really, if ever we get money to start making an episode of the Without a Roof uh, series, I will certainly go deeper in it and test it and to see if it's actually degrading the story to have this kind of gaming rudimentary gaming icons there talking about energy and now I need to eat and or do I have to tell it in another way right to make it more um, um, more impactful so let me go back to the other screen <coughs> So, yeah, so that was the, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Uh, so that was like the first one I, I worked on. And then I did Ocean School, which is wildlife, which is, of course, another, there's other questions there, not to approach the animals, and then, uh, but uh, when you're working with humans, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not that easy. Uh, they're not, sometimes the rules are not that clear, like filming a right whale where you have to stay this amount of meters from the right whale and so on and so on, yeah. right? Nobody says how many meters I have to stay away from this kid to film him, right? There's no rule about that. Uh, so, 
uh, by the way, all the kids that we worked with were real street kids. We had like four of them and they were all like taken care of uh, after the shoot. I think it's important if you go that when you work with people that you pay them, that you give them work or anything um, in a, not too much. Otherwise, you're going to get in trouble, too. Um, and then the whole village is going to run after you. But um, the um, you know, they, we found the, their par some of the families back and some were put in an orphanage where they c would get an education and so on. And the idea was also for him to have a button there that you can actually um, give to a charity that's taking care of the kids that actually were involved in the project. So these are also things that you could, might want to start thinking about, uh, thinking also about the techniques used for the, the, the games for good uh, mechanics that are very well explained for each game. There's a case study of how they did that. Can I interrupt you? Yeah. Yesterday, somebody asked how you used what camera, how, how that worked. So you had an explanation of what kind of camera you used? Well, well yeah, we don't see. This is what I call a back to back camera. I think for documentary work, it's like the easiest solution out there. Um, I think three cameras you can still do as well. It's just because it's easy. There's n I don't have to hassle with too many cameras, batteries and memory cards. And I'm not working for big productions with big budgets. So I want to keep everything very slim and lenient. And I, um, in Kinshasa, I had most of the time electricity. But when I was in the market, I didn't have uh, electricity. So, you know, I can't, if I have to deal with 10 cameras, and I have no electricity, it's going to get complicated. I don't have the budget to then hire a generator and then I have the whole street saying, hey, we want electricity too, right? Why only for the film crew? So, you know, I try to be as stealth as possible always. So um, that's my, my, mostly my choice is like the, what we call a back-to-back -back rig. There's some rigs out there with three cameras. I've seen people working with six camera rigs uh, doing more uh, kind of touristy documentary work. I think that can work because you're not working with people and volunteers and so on that are like, don't understand why it's taking so long. So, you know, that depends on, on, on what's happening on the, the rain. So um, <clears throat> at some point you have these, uh, all these men, uh, trying to understand, uh, uh, all these men are suddenly, um, um, they, they suddenly have empathy. <laughs> <laughs> empathy. Oh, I, d I thought nurses had that and, and, and mothers and, you know, grandmothers and I think dads too. It's not a new thing, right? Empathy. Well, luckily, we all have empathy. Uh, people that don't have empathy are mostly psychopaths. <laughs> and uh, so it's not a new thing, right? Our society would not exist if it wouldn't have any empathy, right? So anyway, it, did, it was used as a sales argument, um, and they succeeded. Um, so I am not like, I think, yes, people can get more compassionate. I prefer the word compassion. Uh, in its broad, broad meaning. Uh, compassion doesn't mean, oh, I'm feeling sorry for you, here is five dollars. It doesn't mean that at all, right? I think there's this Japanese proverb saying, if you're hungry, I will give you a fishing rod, and there you go, right? So you give tools, that people become independent, not just... Anyway, so this is one of the, the I don't know if you've ever saw it, Clouds over Sidra, it's one of those key pieces in, in the young history of, of VR, um, where um, Chris Milk's company at the time that was called Verse, now it's called Within, um, uh, uh, showed this to UN delegates. And I don't know if the refugees uh, were really helped, but he got a lot of money. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> thanks to empathy. So, uh, but, you know, some of the pieces that he did are fun to watch. It's so, again, uh, let me make the difference between virtual reality and 360 video content. I mean, there's also mixes between it. 
Virtual reality mostly is completely CGI. Uh, people want to make a distinction between 360 video content and virtual reality. 360 video, I can't walk around in it, right? Um, virtual reality, it's like in a game, I could like go through a, um, an environment and interact with objects because I have motion controllers and so on. I'll show you some work later on. Um, so, um, of course, this idea about you know, becoming compassionate and everything, it's been research uh, in therapy before that. So, for example, um, um, there, there have been other science projects about embodiment and also in shock therapy. Right, to be confronted with your fears, uh, what we call exposure therapy, kind of what the reality TV uh, thing did uh, kind of <laughs> as well, right? So um, it doesn't come from nowhere, these things, right? So I don't know what these guys felt, right? Honestly, uh, it is, of course, impressive when you put 360 video for the first time on your face. It is quite impressive, right? But as with the magic lantern, you know, we might get used to it and what, what remains of that compassion and empathy and whatever engagement. So let's go back in history and let's get into another <laughs> approach. So there is our empathy machine and next to it is the Verfremdungseffekt by Bertolt Brecht who um, <coughs> in Nazi times, uh, uh, well in the 30s, um, had what we call the epic theater. And he thought it was actually better to keep a distance to raise awareness than to actually make things too emotional because people would become complacent and they would not understand the gravity of the issue if they would get too much emotionally involved. So they, you know, he wanted his audience to have a critical perspective on the social issues that were on the stage, not just like feel sorry or, you know, um, pull out their wallets or their handkerchief. So very, they both, I mean, these, they, they both wanted to change society or have, you know, they're, they're, they, they s both start from with good intentions, I think. But their solution uh, in the methods to be used or the technical artistic methods to be used are very different. But it's interesting. I th honestly, I think most of the time when I, when I am, I work as a DOP as well. So when I'm shooting and, and uh, somebody uh, is, is having a hard time, I'm not going to you know, push in there. I mean, I mostly use very few lenses and no zooms. So I do have to go in closer, but I normally try to build some trust there and I try to feel how people are feeling and I keep a distance, right? So, because I think that's more powerful than to go in there and it's very disrespectful to, um, to go and get a close up of, uh, of somebody crying or something. It's like, I mean, the most powerful pieces that I've seen are things that are shot from a distance, which I think are much more painful to watch than um, than a close-up. Uh, so our friend here, William, talked to me about uh, some empathy research that's been going on now. So um, the Virtual Human Interaction Lab is uh, a lab in Stanford who is actually, Ola, is actually uh, researching, uh, not that, oh, the, the link is there. Apparently I didn't put the link um, in there, but Stanford, uh, they have a lab to actually uh, research scientifically empathy. So they make these experiences and then they track people during a period to see how long the empathy lasts. Do they feel empathy? Do they behave differently if they see a film about Black Lives Matter? Uh, do they gonna react differently when they meet a black person on the subway? an hour later, a day later, a week later, right? So they're doing research on that. So that's very interesting to check on that, check on. Uh, and then uh, there's also VR, a code of ethical conduct. So you see the link there, journal frontiers in the curve. It's a bit long, you wanna maybe take a picture of it. Uh, 
it's actually a, a paper published, uh, what it says, it's the people proposing a code of ethical conduct. Um, so I didn't, I'm going to be honest, I didn't read it yet because it's very long. So I probably, I downloaded it, so I'm going to read it on the plane. Um, but, you know, let's see what they propose, right? I mean, it's it's um, uh, interesting. There are actually people that it's their job, they're, they're studying ethics, so might be. Um, so uh, the Society of Spectacle by Guy Debord uh, uh, is also interesting le uh, literature. Uh, he was talking about uh, media as well. And... Um, you know, we can ask ourselves if VR is just going to be another spectacle, right? Because a spectacle is not the same. Is it, it, when things become a spectacle, then it loses, I think, all of its uh, critical value, right? It's the freak show, right? That's how cinema started in the circus, right? So you had the bearded woman, and then you had the cinema next to it. Um, which, in, of course, in a way, was much more or less spectacle because you had the, the baby washing in the bathtub and all that. So the first um, very simple things. But then, of course, Melies came in and there was more spectacle happening. And I don't have anything against entertainment and all. I do love my, my... I have my zombie moments in front of the television or the computer. But if you're working with social issues and everything, there's a... You know, you don't know how that's going to influence. Um, there's also what he talks about, what the, the gatekeepers, who's going to distribute the content, right? Who, who has more power to push their content forward? So it's already starting to form there, yeah? Because my stuff that I put in YouTube 360 is going to be drowned in, in stuff that's been pushed by, by the New York Times, mm -hmm. or Verse, or the Jaunt, or, and again, most of these are uh, North American companies, and I do love North American content, but I think there's a whole other world out there, and I would love to also see what they are making. And there are already people making v VR, I'm sure, in Iran, or, you know, where is it? Where, did, where can I access it if I'm not, uh, speaking Farsi and reading Farsi, right? So um, it's 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 important that there's there's going to be maybe another wave of more independent gatekeepers and aggregators who are going to try to you know find this content and then give it a portal. So these are also responsibilities that it's not only making it; it's also where are you going to show it to whom are you going to show it? How can you? worm it in um, um, uh, in between the big players that are already placing, you know, they're already trying to monopolize the field. Um, also, who's, you know, who's selling the glasses, who's selling the headsets, who's making the technology, right? Um, the guy who did invent the Oculus is not exactly the example of uh, the most liberal free-minded uh, uh, person out there, right? So um, even from there on, it's already, you know, I mean, it's now there. So we can, like she says, we can hack it, right? We can go above for what it was intended, right? Um, if, uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of, it's like the IKEA hacks, right? Where people take the furniture from IKEA and they, make their own thing with it. So you have to do this with the VR headsets as well, right? They were not maybe intended to show documentary, but in the end, a lot of the 360 video content in the Oculus store is quite popular, right? So it's not true that people are only interested in VR because of games. So um, let me go back to science projects. This is an open source uh, project. It's called Be Another Lab. The code is available, so you can actually do it with your students. Machine to Be Another is a long-term research project combining cognitive science, virtual reality, and personal performances 
to create in users the perceptual illusion of being in the body of another. Be Another Love created this long-term project in seeking ways to better understand ourselves through understanding the other. We can attack our village, destroy our village. Even uh, my father is killed at the same time. We escape from the war. When we get the charge, you are not only support the children and women, is, men is not uh, support at all. I stayed in Tel Aviv six years until you are not allowed to refugee. You must go back to Sudan. If you don't want to go back to Sudan, go to jail and stay there. say Iraq and we don't say Afghanistan and we just say we were over there. We don't have any names for an enemy. I guess the enemy there is just myself. More than an installation, the machine to be another is a system and open platform using embodied narratives, engaging with a community of researchers and creators. Cognitive science experiments have shown that embodied systems can be a powerful tool to reduce implicit racial bias overcome phobias and relieve pain. Can you imagine what could be done with embodied storytelling in future years? Needless to say, as you can see, they were also touching. So I think that's something that she's not really mentioning, but that's really powerful too, right? Because I mean, you're completely in the headset and then other volunteers come and they touch the legs and all, so it's gonna actually uh, make it even more immersive, right? Of course, these are inst installation pieces. You don't have any control um, over something when you make an app and put it on the in the App Store or the Google Play Store. Um, so this is like a, uh, it's free. So the code is available and you can, um, so as you can see, there's all older Oculus used. I'm not sure if they updated it for the new Oculus, I think you can make it work. Um, but it's an interesting test uh, subject and um, yeah, what is great about it is that you can, you know, actually uh, try it um, in the project. So um, yeah, this is another um, photo of um, a filmmaker I love, Raymond Depardon. <coughs> which is a documentary, French documentary filmmaker. This is a picture out of San Clemente, which is a, a documentary piece that he made in an um, in, um, asylum uh, with people with uh, psychological problems, very uh, serious. So is VR, I mean, I mean, you know, 
I show this picture to broadcasters, I told them, you know, can you hide from VR? Right? Because, it's, of course, broadcasters are very reluctant in trying anything new. And, you know, there's also studies being done, of course, how to make money with VR. I mean, that, that's what we're going to be interested in. I'm, of course, interested in what you can do in, in story. So these are all, there's not the only ones. So these are all um, uh, broadcasters, um, agencies that are already have a lot of VR content out there. These are all mostly documentary, right? So I didn't put John in there. I didn't put Verse, that's now within. I, t I talked about it earlier, so they're also out there. Most of it is free, so you, if you have a cardboard, you can start watching content, right? So I guess you all know the New York Times VR content. No, yes, no, yeah. Riots that Huffington Post bought now, so they, <coughs> this is VR journalism. Amnesty International used it in one of their campaigns as well. Arte, which is the uh, French-German um, uh, television broadcaster who um, uh, is more into artistic uh, uh, content. I mean, not, I'm not talking about arts, but more uh, reflective uh, work. Um, USA Today has VR stories. I'm not sure if they still have it, but they had it. Discovery <coughs> VR. Uh, ABC News, BBC Taster, I'll go into that. The NFB, of course, has a history. The Guardian, did, uh, anybody see the piece about uh, uh, the prison cell, 16 by 9? Uh, really watch it, it's really good. Frontline made a very good uh, VR um, uh, piece about South Sudan, which is also free. And then I also put a Flemish one there, the Standard, which is a Belgian uh, Flemish newspaper. And they also now have an app with 360 video content. So, um, so they're different, uh, probably Chinese uh, or also other. Um, I mean, my Chinese is uh, limited to ordering a beer in Mandarin. So I can't really, you know, that's of course, I would love to just swallow a little pill to be able to speak other languages to go and research things, right? Um, but let's, um, so the New York Times are all like closed systems. Um, you can find those apps uh, mostly for free um, and download them and then you can stream it or you can download the content and watch it, it's mostly made for cardboard, right? So let's go into the BBC uh, taster. So, oops, I don't know why my links are not working. Let me just, let me just go in um, Chrome and um, go in it myself. I checked it this morning, but of course when I'm here, links don't work. So it's called BBC Taster, virtual, oh, come up, virtual <coughs> reality there. So what I love about them is, so uh, try, rate, share, and our new idea. So this is kind of the research lab of the BBC. So they uh, put this content out there and they let people uh, see if they like it or not. And that's just like trying to find what works best and what works less. So um, if I go on this one of these la latest, we wait VR. So for example, this is like a, a blocky unity uh, experience uh, on the refugees. So it's interesting to see because they'd also made a 360 video piece. What's going to work best? Is it you know, more like in a unity developed environment or is 360 video uh, better or is it just different? So this is kind of things that are that they're in the back, of course, asking themselves. So there's um, if you go in here, and the stories are mostly there for a limit of time, and then you can go and see and go and inside story, and then there's interviews with the people who worked on it, and there's sometimes also in this website, maybe not exactly in the same page, but they sometimes distribute tools for free. Um, 
to uh, like open source tools, code uh, that they share after they build an experience. Um, so um, this piece, I'm just going to show it because it uses uh, another technique I haven't um, what is Florence to allow Florence? Let's see, I didn't check that one. Either. Let's check. Uh. So. Hello, Alexander Armstrong here. Welcome to Florence. If you want to explore in more detail, just hit pause. This is the Vasari Corridor. It winds its way over a kilometer through the heart of Florence. It houses one of the world's most impressive collections of self-portraits, including Rubens, Holbein, and Rembrandt. So what they use is what we call the, um, uh, a, a laser scanner uh, to build a 3D, photographic 3D environment with all little points. So this is a technique that's uh, being used uh, already in, in several experiences. What it does, and I, we can't show it, show it here because we're in YouTube 360, uh, so I can only go around, right, and up and down. But with this kind of experience, you could actually make a, an experience that's photographic and you could walk around it, in it. Right? You could, like in a game, go forward, like make your, yourself or your avatar or whatever. So, but this is the typical look of the 3D scanning. Uh, piece. Italy's invisible cities. So this is also, they also have different kind of contact. There's nature, there's history. Right? So different kind of, uh, of genres that are, are, are being explored. Again, also do understand that that sound is so important when you make Im immersive projects, right? So Noni de la Peña uses, you know, the real sound but has these CGI environments and the sound helps you to actually get immersed even if it's blocky characters. So you can see the corridor winding its way through the middle anyway. of the Florence. Let's uh, I'm just gonna you know I'm just showing some stuff that's out there. Um, so I don't know, you know, um, what the future is gonna be from for VR or uh, I mean, I think the, the idea is that we all try to get out there and make work. Um, we'll maybe win some battles and some we will lose. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, 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 I think it's just a fun moment here now that you, you know, have an opportunity to rethink your visual storytelling, right? A lot of it was stopped. Uh, because things got standardized and and we, people started to make big money with it and then you know it has to be standardized and now we're in this little moment where nobody really knows how they're gonna make money with it so there's an opening for people with a more artistic approach to try things right so it is um, I also don't know if it's a good or a bad thing I mean with all technology it's the use of it right it can all be good and bad. Um, airplanes were invented to stop wars, and in the end, they of course became horrible war machines, right? So, um, yeah. If you have any questions, I can answer them for the next six minutes, apparently. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you for yeah. How often in your projects have you? felt that uh, like having those ethical conversations with people about uh, like exploiting just like as a broad way of thinking about it with like your producers or the people you're working with are those conversations hard for you at this point? Oh I always try to to bring them in uh, in some way or another I think they're they're very basic questions to ask uh, 
Um, I mostly try to work with pro producers that are uh, aware of it at least. Um, and the other ones are not even going to ask me to come on board. Because that will just be a pain in the ass. So, you know, uh, so, um, uh, I mean, the, the, it's unavoidable and, and um, you know, for me to uh, be happy with myself, I can't just, you know, go, go and make reality TV and just shut my m mind off and, you know, so even if that means that I have periods, long periods of no job, <laughs> right? So, I mean, uh, it's up to you. Um, and, you know, I can't do it without asking those questions. That's how I kind of was trained to be a critical thinker in the first place and not just execute what people ask me to do, right? I mean, we know what happens when people just do that and then they say, we have a sneak ghost, right? We didn't know it. We didn't know it. We killed millions of people. We didn't know it. Somebody asked us to put little numbers there. I didn't know we were each number was a dead person. So we all have a responsibility from the smallest task that you do. Right? So, yeah. How about the ethics of working with a technology that's not so accessible to most people? Um, I don't think it's not accessible. Uh, there's a lot of little tools out there, like I showed some stuff that I can just plug on my iPhone. And, uh, oh, it's in my backpack. If you can get my backpack in your office. It's just this, uh, oh, maybe I can show it in the, in, uh, on the website. So, uh, uh, so th there's several, I mean, there's cheaper cameras out there and honestly you can, you can build uh, something really cheap. Uh, yes, the stitching software is really expensive. Uh, so but you can, but the, those things come with stitching software that doesn't cost anything. So, so is yeah. everything you do available on cardboard? Most of it, yes. Yeah. Um, I did work in non -public, on non-public prototypes that were only available in Inoculus or in the Vive. But these are non-public prototypes. They're like insider. Thank you. Th these are insider um, work that you know the NFB. The, I worked on with the NFB on on some stuff. Uh, it's what they do is they try. They bring in artists and they try to um, uh, make artists aware of these tools. So I come in and I give like a crash course or something or. I come in because they can't get it finished and I come in and try to finish it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's, um, uh, yeah. So, yeah, so this is the one, uh, this is the Android version that you've seen and this is the iPhone version. Of course, you need to have a, 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 an iPhone and an Android uh, that already costs 700 or $800, right? But this thing costs is there a price on it? It's really inexpensive, $150 or something. Uh, so it comes with free stitching software. Of course, it's not the same video quality as a red camera rig or something, right? But to start and just wrap your head around it, it's great. That's what I tell, I mean, I mostly give talks uh, for indie filmmakers and where I know people don't have a lot of money. So I always go from a perspective of finding ways to actually make content without waiting to get a million dollars, right? Um, <clears throat> so there is stuff out there. If you, if you look, this is an example, but there's uh, the Samsung Gear 360, Gear 360 camera costs what, 500 or 350 dollars. It comes with stitching software. So you don't have to invest thousand fifteen hundred dollars in the color software. It's not the best software maybe out there, but at least you can start um, trying out things and 
try out the, f the things first that all everybody says that you shouldn't do in 360, like putting the camera um, uh, in inside the flower or whatever, right? And you just want to <coughs> try try out things. I, what I do, of course, is always to test it on myself first. I just check it out, and if I get um, yeah, dizzy or quickly uh, bored by it, then probably uh, I'm not going to bother anybody with it. So, <coughs> um, yeah, I, I'm not, I don't agree. I think there, there, there is a possibility now to make... A, I read uh, recently an article about somebody actually using just their iPhone and an app to make panoramic 360 photos. And what she made was a piece, it's photos, but there's like a narrator there. Uh, and it actually, you can, it's actually interesting as a story. Um, they do a hike up a mountain, and that works too. So it's not only 360 videos, 360 photos. Uh, yesterday, I showed a lot of free tools out there as well. If you don't know Unity, there's other things out there that are mostly free. So I was thinking more on the other side of the audience. Like, but if you put things on Google Cardboard, of course, but yeah. there are other stuff on Oculus and Vive. And Oh yeah, you, that, that's, that. no, I don't have an Oculus neither at home and I don't have a Vive, right? So I can't, if things are only on, on Steam and Vive, I can't really um, uh, watch it, except when they would make a, a light version of it or the 360 video version of it. So of course I can't see everything. Um, there might be some places popping up where they actually uh, have like the arcade, uh, experience where you know you put in a dime and you can get into a vibe or something. Yeah. I think that would be a good option yeah. actually. They used to in the 80s have yeah, so um, yeah, the cardboard is like the cheapest solution out there. The apps that you know from the news agents they're all yeah. free. Yeah. So I watch a lot of those and I have I also have like a, a plastic versions of cardboard that are a bit more comfortable and they also cost 20 or 25 dollars. They're mostly Chinese brands that make some kind of copy of the Gear VR, but they are, they accept older phones and all kinds of different Android devices and iPhone devices. You have to check if it's comp compatible with your phone. So there's a way of, of, you know, going around that. Yes, I brought a PSVR, um, but that's me, right? Um, because I, I, I do play games on the PlayStation and when the PSVR came out, I tested it and I thought it was a good quality price. So now when I'm making experiences, I compress it to be able to watch it in my PSVR. So and yes, I had to invest in a Windows and a Mac computer and an Android and an iPhone because I need to test it, right? So I can't, I mean, I try to make things that are available on all platforms and that's that's still a, a bit of a hassle, but in the end, you know, we also have a lot of video formats that didn't change, right? We have MPEG-4 and we have .mov and we have .av and there's different containers for different kinds of codecs and so on. So if you publish something on Facebook, it's not gonna be the same as on your website. And if I want it to be make available in low bandwidth situations, then I have to make another website for that that's gonna come up to compensate or whatever, so there's still you know, so that, that's the same, right? So uh, yeah. Hmm. Other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.